Particle physics is filled with various paradoxical things, but some of these particles, called gluons, behave extremely strangely. By definition, gluons are the quantum carriers of the so-called strong interaction, which binds protons and neutrons in an atom, as well as quarks inside the protons and neutrons themselves. And perhaps at this point, we need to say a few words about how modern quantum physics conceives the interaction of elementary particles. In quantum field theory, any particle interaction is described as a result of these particles exchanging with other particles. For example, consider the electromagnetic interaction between two electrons, which have like charges and therefore repel each other. Quantum field theory interprets this repulsion as a result of electrons exchanging quanta of the electromagnetic field, photons. This phenomenon can be likened to a simple analogy from classical mechanics. Imagine two astronauts flying parallel to each other and throwing a soccer ball back and forth. When the first astronaut throws the ball, according to the law of conservation of momentum, he gains a velocity directed opposite to the direction of the throw. When the second astronaut catches the ball, he absorbs the momentum imparted to him and begins to move in the same direction as the ball, away from the first astronaut. When the second astronaut, in turn, throws the ball, he too is pushed in the same direction, and so on. If we observe this from a distance where the ball is no longer visible, it might appear as though the astronauts are subject to some repulsive force, although in reality, they are just passing the ball back and forth. The electrical repulsion between electrons works in a very similar way, only they pass photons instead of a ball. It's a bit more complicated to imagine how the exchange of photons can result in an attractive force between oppositely charged particles, such as an electron and a positively charged proton. However, analogies in quantum physics should generally be approached with caution. Particles responsible for mediating interactions are called gauge bosons. Sometimes the term bosons is used, but this is not entirely accurate. All gauge bosons are bosons, but not all bosons are mediators of interaction. For the electromagnetic field, as mentioned earlier, the carriers of interaction are photons. Other interactions have their own carrier particles, and gluons are the carriers of the strong interaction, which involves quarks, the tiniest known building blocks of matter, and the objects formed from these quarks, such as protons and neutrons. It is thanks to this interaction-driven attraction between protons and neutrons that atomic nuclei are formed. The particle mediating the electromagnetic interaction, the photon, does not itself participate in this interaction since the photon has a charge of zero. However, with gluons, things are a bit more complex. They themselves participate in strong interaction, both between quarks and among themselves. And this interaction takes place exactly through the exchange of other gluons. So here's what happens. Consider two quarks, one of which emits a gluon toward the other within the framework of the strong interaction. This gluon immediately starts interacting with each of the quarks, generating additional gluons. Each of these gluons also interacts with both quarks, the initial gluon, and each other, resulting in the creation of new gluons, which in turn generate even more gluons. The gluon population explosion is limited by the fact that an individual gluon lives for literally a moment, about 10 to 23 seconds, before being absorbed by some other particle. The processes of gluon birth and absorption occur at approximately the same rate, so the number of particles remains roughly constant at any given moment in time. By the way, it's often said that a proton or neutron consists of three quarks, but that's not quite accurate. In reality, Inside each such particle exists a colossal number of quarks and antiquarks, spontaneously born from the vacuum as particle-antiparticle pairs and annihilating with each other after tiny fractions of a second. Simply put, at any given moment, the number of up quarks inside, for example, a proton, is two more than the number of corresponding antiquarks. And for down quarks, it's one more than the number of down antiquarks contained within the proton. This is why it's said that there are three quarks in total, plus a chaotically boiling quantum foam of quarks, antiquarks, and gluons, where 99% of what we perceive as the mass of a proton or neutron is actually the energy of this boiling. By the way, this is roughly why you can't just remove one of the quarks from a proton or neutron as you can remove an electron from an atom 
by applying a certain amount of energy. The energy of the electron's interaction with a positively charged nucleus is inversely proportional to the distance between them. If you try to remove the electron from the nucleus, the bond weakens. If the electron moves far enough away, the bond becomes so weak that it can be ignored. With quarks, it's a different story because gluons can chaotically multiply, generating new gluons until they are absorbed by a quark. The farther we remove a quark, the longer the gluons live and the more daughter gluons they produce in the process. Thus, the total number and energy of gluons increase when removing a quark, leading to an increase in the strength of the strong interaction. So, if removing an electron from an atom reduces interaction energy, removing a quark from a proton or neutron increases it. Moreover, processes leading to states with higher energy in physics generally don't occur. The property of quarks to exist only in certain quark-gluon combinations and not individually is also known as confinement. If you impart very high energy to a proton or neutron simultaneously, you can still break it apart, causing its constituent quarks to scatter in different directions. The energy transferred to the composite particle immediately condenses into a sea of additional gluons, quarks, and antiquarks, a so-called quark-gluon plasma. This state is extremely unstable and collapses back into a proton or neutron or other quark complexes within a very short time. Furthermore, powerful energy fields can generate other particles, which is the principle behind searching for new particles in accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider. Now the most interesting part. Theoretically, gluons can condense into stable structures that contain no quarks, nothing but gluons themselves. We're talking about peculiar gluonic droplets where gluon birth and absorption processes are balanced and the total amount, or more precisely, the cumulative gluon energy remains constant. It's possible to form quasi-particles consisting solely of gluons, similar to how protons or neutrons consist of a mixture of gluons and quarks. These gluonic droplets can be quite stable structures. Theoretically, gluonic droplets can be well optimized in terms of energy, such that increasing or decreasing the number of gluons they contain increases their energy per particle. As mentioned earlier, processes that increase the total energy of a system in nature generally don't occur, so properly constructed gluonic droplets are resistant to merging several droplets into one, breaking down a larger droplet into smaller ones, evaporating individual gluons from a droplet, or, conversely, condensing gluons from the surrounding space. Therefore, we're dealing with a relatively stable quasi-particle. These objects are also known as glue balls. Glue balls are expected to be quite fascinating objects. In terms of size, they should be roughly comparable to a proton or neutron with a radius on the order of 10 than a 15 meters. Although individual gluons apparently do not possess mass, similar to photons, they do carry energy. When sealed within a glue ball, this energy should manifest itself as mass externally. In other words, a glue ball composed of numerous massless gluons should be massive. According to calculations, the mass of glue balls should be quite substantial, several times, if not tens of times, heavier than a proton. With mass, glue balls should generate a gravitational field affecting other bodies. However, this is essentially the extent of their interaction with the surrounding world. Neither individual gluons nor the glue balls they form have electric charge, meaning they do not participate in electromagnetic interactions and consequently do not interact with electromagnetic waves, including visible light. Additionally, glue balls do not participate in the weak interaction, which is known for its role in interactions involving neutrinos. They do participate in strong interaction, but this interaction is almost negligible at distances greater than 10 to 15 meters, whereas the typical distance between atoms in matter, even in dense solids, is usually approximately a million times larger. Essentially, gravity is the only means of interaction between gluons and the surrounding world. It's important to note that gravity is the weakest of all fundamental interactions, often disregarded as insignificant on the scale of the microworld. From the perspective of particle physics, glue balls are extreme introverts, hardly interested in external events and behaving almost like perfect invisibles, as they almost never manifest themselves. This is precisely why astrophysicists and cosmologists are highly interested in glue balls.
individuals who have been unsuccessfully searching for dark matter for many years. Dark matter is a mysterious substance invisible due to its lack of interaction with electromagnetic radiation, yet possessing mass and therefore forming gravitational fields, influencing the motion of stars, galaxies, and galaxy clusters. Essentially, dark matter could be imagined as a collection of glue balls that condensed from primordial matter immediately after the Big Bang alongside familiar protons and neutrons. If such a cloud of glue balls indeed exists, we can only infer its existence through its gravitational effects on visible bodies. In this sense, glue balls are nearly perfect candidates for dark matter. With one caveat, we cannot be certain of their existence. Theoretically, their existence is possible and supported by calculations, leaving us fairly confident that such entities must exist somewhere in the universe. However, this is not sufficient, and we would greatly desire to observe a glue ball in its natural state. Yet, observing a glue ball is highly problematic. These particles excel at evading any available observation methods. One approach involves attempting to observe the birth of a glue ball during the condensation of quark gluon plasma. Unfortunately, this method is prone to confusing glue balls with neutral mesons, particles composed of quark-antiquark -quark pairs adorned with gluons. Scientists have observed something resembling glue balls in several experiments, such as those in 2014, 2015, and 2018. However, definitive certainty that these are indeed glue balls remains elusive. Furthermore, we could attempt to observe existing glue balls, places where their density is sufficient for them to come into close proximity and interact with each other and other particles via strong interaction. Such conditions may exist in the cores of the most massive neutron stars and similar objects. Due to their extremely high density, greater than that of a proton or neutron, which are monstrous in their own right, an object composed of glue balls might outwardly resemble a black hole, albeit with certain distinctive features. These objects are sometimes referred to as gray holes, black holes of the second kind, or Q stars. Currently, several candidates for Q stars are known. For example, one component of the binary system V44 Cygni is listed in our catalogs as a black hole. Unfortunately, our capabilities for studying such objects are currently very limited, and we cannot provide a definitive answer regarding them. Nevertheless, ongoing efforts to search for glue balls persist as their discovery could provide answers to many questions of scientific interest and serve as a significant milestone in advancing our understanding of the structure of our universe.